Testing, testing, okay. Uh, welcome to CS 4510. This is the third day, uh, first half, and today's topic is on regular expressions. Do you guys know what a regular expression is? Have you seen a regular expression used in like a programming language at any point? Like a filter, maybe if you use Linux or your Unix kind of person, you've used, uh, like if you type in a terminal, if you type in like ls star dot pdf, right? The, the star operation fills into zero or more strings of this and this will print all uh, PDF files in that directory, right? So the regular expressions in Unix are actually have a history that come from uh, the topic that we're talking about today. The regular in regular expressions is related to the regular languages. These are also called regexts. So what is a regular expression? First of all, a regular expression is just a string way to represent a regular language. So So uh, just to double down here, a regular expression itself is a string, but it represents a language, and a language is a set of strings. So you have one string to represent like a set of strings. So, uh, and we defined, uh, the, we talked kind of la a little bit vaguely about how uh, doing some magic with NFAs and DFAs, you can prove some properties about the regular languages. Um, we're going to... We, We'll talk about closure uh, towards the end of the lecture, but uh, it turns out you, you, that the regular languages are exactly, uh, the regular languages are the smallest class of languages which are closed under uh, concatenation, union, and uh, the star operation, and they contain some small uh, basic elements. So. So the regular languages are the smallest class of languages containing the singleton languages, the set containing the empty string, the empty set, and they're closed under union concatenation in, these, in this uh, clean star operation, which we'll define what that is in a second. So uh, a regular expression, before we just go into some examples, I'm just going to give you uh, uh, the definition. It's either... Uh, the string of the empty set, uh, the empty string, or A uh, for all A in sigma. So you have a string which represents the empty set. You have a string which represents not the empty string, but actually the set containing the empty string. So we, we don't want to write uh, this every time because we're lazy. Right, uh, but there's a small type error that has to be here. When you get into the, the rhythm of things, it, it, this abstracts away from us. But when we write the empty, for a regular expression, when we write epsilon here, we're not actually talking about the empty string itself. We're talking about the set containing the empty string. It turns out it's the same. Uh, here we're also talking about the sets containing the singleton um, L elements. So these are also going to be not the strings themselves, but the sets containing those minimal strings. Right. Uh, so those are our three base cases for what a regular expression is. And then we define a regular expression recursively. So we say um, if 
uh, R i, R j are regular expressions. Uh, then. Uh, so are uh, R i union R j. Now, as a string, this is a string. This is a string. We just put the symbol in between the two strings. Uh, R i R j. So this would be union. This is concatenation. Did I spell that right? Concatenation. Concatenation. And then what we, what we call the clean star. And this is the, the star operation. Kind of like sigma star. What we mean by, uh, when we take anything to a star, what we mean is zero or more copies of it. So what we quite literally mean is that like ri star is going to be equal to the union of i equals 0 to infinity. Well, we have i there. Let's do uh, k of r i to the k. So just zero more copies of that regular expression, including zero copies, which is the empty string. Yes? What does it mean to be closed? Ah, we'll talk about that uh, more towards the end. And an operation is closed with respect to a set if operating under that operation keeps you in the set, basically. Like, for example, the integers are not closed under division. The, inner, the naturals are not closed under subtraction, because you could have a negative. But the addition of two naturals is always going to be a natural. Like, under the operation, you get the same type of element back. We'll talk about that at, at the end. I could have talked about it at the beginning, but I, I think it's, uh, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Uh, so this is what a regular expression is recursively in terms of the definition. Um, but the, you know, it's not easy to learn just from a definition what it is. So let's do. Uh, a couple examples. So what about, what do you guys think this regular expression is? So I'm writing a string, but I'm, I want to ask what, this, what language do you think this string represents? So some of these are, have strings, and some of them have uh, like nice human definitions of what it is. Yeah. What's the difference between union and Ah, a union is like, like a like a set union. Okay, so like if it's if R I is like A A and R J is A B, then it would be like A A B or. So it would be like A. So this is like A or B, right? Either A or B. Right. So just to give you a, a quick example, oh, okay. A union B. Let's do that. Is going to be the set containing A or the set containing B. Okay, so it just returns a set back. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So the, each each regular expression is a string, but it, it defines a set. Okay. Meanwhile, a b is equal to the set containing a b, right? So in general, like any two languages, uh, the concatenation is the concatenation of all pairs of strings, right? So right. like so like l i uh, l j is equal to x y such that x is in l i and y is in lj, right? Okay. That means the concatenation of two uh, languages. I should have defined that, yeah. So just through some inference, what do you guys think the first string represents? Yeah. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that give you everything in the language? Yeah. Right. But what's the name of that one? Well, the name? I mean, that's correct, but there's a notation that we made up. Sigma star. Exactly, yeah. This is just sigma star. In fact, sigma star is a definition. We taught it as a definition. It's actually a regular expression. Why? Sigma is A union B, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's exactly sigma star. Yes? Did you say the star means it's closed? The star is zero or more copies of whatever is in the star operation. So for example, A star is going to be zero or more copies of A. So it's going to be zero copies of A. It's going to be one copy of A, two copies of A. Right? So this is really like um, a to the n, n is a number. Right? That's this, what the star means. 
So here, let's, you can also think of a regular expression as producing a specific string. If you uh, fix the star to be some number, like let's say it's three, then you can choose the individual's uh, strings there, right? So like A union B to the three is going to be A union B, A union B, A union B, something like this. And then we're going to just, we can, when we do the union, we can choose which one we want from there, right? So we're, we're sort of taking the general regular expression and we're like restricting it. So I, I'm going to choose the A here, I'm going to choose the B here, and I'm going to choose the A here. So this will produce like uh, A, B, A, right? Wait. It'll produce other things, but it'll produce that one, yeah. A union B um, to the third would produce a set, right? Absolutely. A set with all the possible like strings. Of yes. A and B, like yes. Okay. Yes. What I'm showing, like, if we if we consider one specific right, right, right. production, sort of, it'll produce produces many things. But just if I were to look at one production of it, like, as an idea of how to check if a string is produced by a language a, a, a expression. Yes. This is from before. It might be stupid, but what does singleton mean? Singleton is a set containing one element. Oh. Okay. It's single. Yeah. No, it's a good. It's a good. Uh, it's a good question. Okay, so that's uh, A union B star. What about um, A star, a B, A star? This would also produce a set, right? Yes, would... this is a set of strings. But what is this set of strings? It's like as many copies of A and then B and then as many copies of A. Yes. So it's... A's with a B in the middle. I in the middle. Or towards any other end. So yeah. this A could be the empty string. Think about non-deterministically all possible productions. Right. Think about what that looks like. That, that's magically, that's whatever that space looks like. This is, could be the empty string. So it could be a B followed by any number of A's, including zero A's. So it could just be B. Could be BAA. Could be ABAA. There's a human name for this regular expression. I don't expect you to get this one because we're, we're still warming up. But this is going to be uh, all strings containing exactly one B. Right? So it always contains a B. The B, it doesn't, it's never the empty string. And it can never contain only A's. So you should be able to understand this in a human no, notion as this, uh, uh, the set of strings, the language of strings containing exactly one B. Is yes. the regular expression um, the A star B A star, or is it like the set of like set of strings containing exactly one B? Ah, the, well, that's this is this. That's what this defines. So this is a regular expression A star B A star, but I claim that A star B A star produces a language. Both and that, of them are regular expressions. Like, ah, no, this is just a human definition okay, of it, but, right? The left side is the regular expression. Yes. The regular expression is a string over these symbols, union, concatenation, and star. It's got some, some letters in there, right? It'll, it, so let's, so we know this one is the set of strings containing exactly one B. What about, um, here's a slightly harder one, A union B star, B, A union B star. Set of strings containing at least one B? Yes. Why? You guys see that? So again, think recursively. This part is a regular expression for sigma star. This part is a regular expression for sigma star. So there's any, we can, we can non-deterministically choose a prefix and a postfix. I can also, sometimes we write it like this to be short. When we don't want to write A, excuse, whoa. A union B star is kind of annoying to keep writing. So we a lot of times just write sigma star as a regular expression. So this is non-deterministically choose any prefix, fix a B somewhere in the string, Non-deterministically choose any postfix, postfix. So basically like, but the B has to be there, right? There could be Bs in here and there could be Bs in here. Here there couldn't be Bs in the A stars, right? So this is, the, this is a regular expression for the set of strings that produce exactly, uh, have at least one B. That's all yeah. OK. 
Okay. Um, so given that, what about, uh, and I'm giving you, I'm just throwing, throwing things here. What about uh, uh, sigma sigma star? That's different than sigma star sigma star. All the strings are even length. Exactly, exactly. So sigma sigma is going to be something of length 2. Sigma sigma is going to be a union b concatenated a union b. So this is quite literally going to be uh, any string of length, any possible string of length 2, right? So just sigma sigma by itself is going to be what? It's going to be a a, a b, b a, b b. Then when you take it to the star operation, you do any zero more copies of the strings of length 2. So it's just going, there's going to be no order on the structure, on the order of the letters, but the length is going to be even. Yes? Did you say it could be epsilon? Epsilon is allowed as a valid, as a valid uh, um, rule. And when we, take this, when we take the star, the zero or more copies, the zero copies is going, to, is going to get us the epsilon empty string. Right? So basically, any regular expression to the zero, if you have zero copies of something, it's always the empty string. Just sort of kind of like an identity rule. Like, like anything to the zero power is like one, right? It's, it's similar with string math. Yes? So if you want some, like, OK, wait, wait, no, my, my question. I figured out my answer. Sorry. OK, that's fine. All right, so let's say I do, here's one more. Again, you can imagine the strings it produces, but I'm looking for like a human characterization, a natural characterization. A set of strings containing A, A, B as a substring? Yeah, so this is a substring, basically. This is kind of the idea, a uh, big idea about non-determinism here. So basically, like, if you think deterministically, and it's a big point in this class, you think deterministically, you maybe have done an algorithm for finding a substring in a string, and maybe there's some dynamic programming or something going on there, there's something complicated, or maybe you just loop over, but it feels like you have to look at everything. Here, to produce a set of strings that contain A, A, B as a substring, you can just do it magically, non-deterministically. You just say, I just fix A, A, B, and then I non-deterministically choose the prefix and the postfix for to be all possible combinations of things that could come before and things that could come after. And somehow magically you produce the set of all strings that contain A, A, B as a substring by doing the A, A, B part first and then producing everything else around it. You don't have to like take an input a string and then check if it's A, A, check it if it has A, A, B. You just put the A, A, B there and then produce everything else. So it's kind of, uh, you have to get used to using the magic a little bit, but uh, once you do it, it's really, it's fun, I guess. OK, so these are some regular expressions, some examples of regular expressions. Um, let's, we, we, we're, every language we've given here is regular, and we call them regular expressions. So I can't even pretend that they're not equivalent to exactly the regular languages. Uh, but we need to prove it. We need to prove that every regular expression decides, produces exactly and only a regular language. So we're going to have to do a double uh, set containment proof. Uh. Oh, I erased the wrong one. That's okay. Let uh, curly L Rex be the class of languages produced by Uh, by regular expressions. We prove that 
uh, L rex is exactly the regular languages. Wait, Professor, do you have to prove both ways for this? Yes, we do. We have to do a double set containment. So what we're going to do first is we're going to, uh, again, do a simulation trick. We're going to convert either DFAs or NFAs into regular expressions, and then we're going to convert regular expressions into either DFAs or NFAs. So basically, we're going to do two parts. We're going to first, we're going to prove, uh, let's see if I can remember which way do we do first. We're going to convert, we're going to convert the regular expression first to a uh, NFA. And then we're going to prove, we're going to convert the NFAs uh, into regular expressions. You know, you recall a little bit of elementary set theory. If you show double containment, then they could only be equal, right? The first one shows that the NFAs are more, are more powerful, or at least as powerful as the regular expressions. The second one shows that the regular expressions are at least as powerful as the NFAs. So combined, they, just, they only could be the same, right? That's enough to show that they decide exactly the same languages. Yes? If, if you prove that the regular expressions are a subset of NFAs, wouldn't you prove that NFAs are as powerful as regular expressions? Yeah, but uh, there's an equality for both of these. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, you know what? You take the equality for just in general, like even for numbers. If you have A greater than B greater than or equal to B, and then B greater than or equal to A, then they, it could only be the case that they're equal, no. right? You take these two things, that implies that A equals B. It could only, it could only be that case, right? right. No, that wasn't what I was asking. Oh, okay. I, was, I was confused by like your wording. I think you said the first one proves that NFAs. The NFAs are at least as powerful okay, okay. Yeah. as the regular expressions. I wanted to say more powerful or equal to in power. Okay. Sorry. It's a, little, it's a little funny in the morning. OK, so um, let's do this first one. Uh, well, first, I guess. This one's actually easier. Um, how, given the definition of regular expressions, the formal definition of regular expressions that I erased, how would, what is the proof technique that you guys think we should use to, pr to convert any regular expression into an NFA? Induction, right? Induction, right? Yeah, so in, we're going to do proof by induction. We'll call this 1-1. One, one. We'll do proof by induction. Uh, why are we doing proof by induction? Well, it, it, if you have a natural recursive definition, you should have a natural proof by induction. It's kind of obvious. Historically, even the words induction and recursion were kind of interchangeable. Now they mean different things, but back in the day, like 100 years ago, they, they didn't really mean different things. So we're going to do a proof by induction. So uh, what we're going to do is show that every regular expression has an equivalent NFA for it. So base case, so we're going to, so uh, base case is what? I'll, let me write out the proof idea. We want uh, to prove every regular expression as an equivalent NFA. Also, why am I choosing NFAs here, not DFAs? Is because NFAs can be easier to work with. They're, sometimes the non-determinism lets you do funny things, and you can do things. Sometimes you want the restricted structure of the DFA to make the proof simpler. You just choose whatever is going to make the proof simpler. Here, we're choosing NFAs, and you'll see quite easily why we're going to choose NFAs. So the base cases are going to be exactly the base uh, cases that were for the regular expressions, right? So recall that the base cases, what were the base cases for the regular expression that I already, that, 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 that I already erased? They were going to be uh, the empty set, uh, the empty string, and then like A and B and so on, right? So we need to show that these are, that these regular expressions are, also produce regular languages. So by giving NFAs for the following uh, languages. So can we give NFAs for those? What is an NFA for the empty string? It's just like a circle. It's like just a circle. And then it just always rejects. Yeah, like that. That decides the empty 
set. Why? There are no except states. Therefore, and it's an NFA, so we don't have to even well define. We can do a DFA for, for this one, right? It's going to reject all strings, right? So this, this correctly defined, this correctly uh, is an NFA for the empty set. What about the empty string? Well, you could do like the same thing, but you could put a circle in there, and then there you go. if you just make it an NFA instead of a DFA, then it should work right. That is, a DF, that is an NFA for the empty string that's going to accept only the empty string. As soon as you see any other symbol, you implicitly reject from that one. OK, what about A and B as singletons? Well, you could do like the same thing, but you just, oh, wait, no, you can't. It's like a two-state thing, mm -hmm. the first state, and then it like transfers over to a second accept state if there's like an A, and it rejects everything else. Yeah, that's going to be a minimal NFA for the base case, A, B, and, and so on. So now we get to, we've shown the base cases of the regular expression, R regular. We get to assume uh, we're going to uh, perform by the induction I hop, uh, by the induction hypothesis, assume that uh, expressions uh, R i R j uh, produce regular produce regular languages. We show uh, what we want to show uh, R i union R j uh, R i Rj and Ri star are uh, that these three are regular. So instead of doing a very formal proof for this, I'm going to just draw pictures, and the proof is actually quite obvious. If we, by the induction hypothesis, Ri and Rj are regular. Therefore, there exists DFAs or NFAs for the languages produced by Ri and Rj. We'll call those uh, like this. I'm trying to write it so I have enough room. Yeah, so let this be the generic uh, DFAs or NFAs. Let's let them be DFAs. doesn't really matter right now. So let's say these are some generic looking DFAs for Ri and Rj respectively. This one is for Ri, we'll call this Di. We'll call this one uh, Dj, right? And we want to produce, show that Ri union Rj is regular, right? So somehow these have some interlinking wires and some states and you know whatever. Something's going on in them. So uh, what are we going to do? How would we build a new NFA? For this language, yes. Can you just add like a new start state out front, and then you just connect the start exactly. state to both? Exactly. There we go. Okay. We have now yes. So does this prove that for like any union of two regular languages, two or more regular, maybe not more, but two regular languages, you can like. It'll produce yes. another regular language. Exactly. The union of two, and then this is, we'll get back to this on, on, the, on the closure part. But we have proven that if two languages are regular, then the union of those two languages are regular. This is back to the thing I erased about uh, the regular languages uh, being closed under union, right? So the union of two, regu two regular languages is regular, certainly. But this extends to like any amount as long as. Like the amount is not mm, Depends. It depends. It gets funny. You have to, as long as the DFA is finite at the end, or the NFA is finite in size. Right. So as long as it isn't like infinite many yeah. regular languages that yes. you're unioning. Absolutely. Would, Absolutely. Okay. In fact, the union of infinitely many regular languages is not regular. Right. Because we'll, then you would have infinite. We'll prove that okay. later. Um, what about the concatenation? So we're going to do a similar pictorial, uh, pictorial proof. So let this be uh, like di, and let this one be a dj. 
And let's say these have some states like this. So again, everything has one start state by definition, but perhaps more than one um, uh, accept state. So how would we prove the concatenation of two uh, regular expressions is regular? Yes? Is it just you connect like all of the ending nodes to the start node of the next one? And yeah. You just add an epsilon transition from there? Exactly. So the, you would also have to remove this as the start state. And then you say epsilon and epsilon. So basically, recall that ri, rj is going to be the concatenation of strings in ri, strings in R, rj. Like if this was like a star, b star, this would be like any number of a's followed by any number of b's. So you non-deterministically choose the first, the number of a's, then you non-deterministically choose the number of b's. You would non-deterministically choose uh, the path that gets you accept for the exact number of a's you want, and then you would choose the exact number of b's you want, right? So here, the non-deterministic path corresponds to the number non-deterministic choice of the number of a's. Yes? Wait, so R i R j is the same as R i star R j star? No. Or these are just, I'm just saying that these are, these are something. Oh, if the first one was a star and the second exactly, one is a yeah. star. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were saying like. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this one's a little harder. R i, uh, I put R j. R i star. What? Uh, we, we're going to do a similar pictorial proof here. So we only we don't have Rj, so we're just going to do one Ri. Well, Di. Um, we'll put one start state. Some accept states. Let's let this one think for a minute, because this one's actually a little hard. The expected solution is actually not correct. If you... It's like infinite many copies, right? Yeah, so the star is going to be zero or more copies of Ri. Can you just set it to the start state? Ah, that won't work. Right. That won't work, actually, it turns out. Like, if you try to, if you do an epsilon transition to the big end, to the beginning, uh, that's seductive to think. But actually, there's a small error with that. What you actually have to do is add a new start state, then you epsilon uh, transition to that, to the old start state, then you epsilon transition, uh, I'll write it outside so it's clear. And you have to mark this one, I think, as the... Let me double check, because I messed this up before. Yeah, you mark this one as, the, as an accept state, because you need to accept zero more copies. You need to accept the empty string. So uh, this little gadget here is... Uh, maybe I'll leave this as an exercise. But try and prove for some DFAs why just adding the epsilon transitions doesn't work. You can accept strings that you're not designed to, because the uh, start state may have incoming transitions already. Right, there may be some funky structure there. Here, this is certainly outside the system, so this is not going to disturb something it shouldn't by making this an accept state. Right, it's not going to perturb something. So you need to do something like this basically to to fix that. Oh my god! Nope. Okay. So uh, we didn't use many words for this one, but we could re-describe them real quick. So for this one, uh, given two DFAs, uh, add a new start state, add epsilon transitions to the old start states, and then you, have, you now congrats, you have an NFA for the regular expression maintaining the union. Uh, for the concatenation, take the start states of the first one and epsilon, trans epsilon transition them to these, excuse me, take the final states of the old one Epsilon transition them to the start state of the new of the second one. Erase the start states of the first one. I forgot to do that one. That's kind of important, right? Um, and then uh, make the second one start state not a start state anymore. And now you have a DFA for the concatenation. You go A to B. You go A B. Yes. For the bottom, instead of adding an accept state at the beginning, can't you just change the the one that you're not accepting to be accept? This one? Yeah, that one. Ah, I claim that there is a bug there. 
It's a little... I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but there is a small issue that happens. Like, you can construct a counterexample. Okay. Basically, and I, I mean, you can try. It's an exercise in the tips book as well. I'm kind of lazy, so I don't want to. I don't want to do it. But perhaps you can believe at least this works. Something else, and you can believe me that at least this works, even if something else doesn't work, right? So, I'll, I'll leave it to you to explore that kind of little counterexample, um, right? And we've proved that the that the star operator is also regular, right? If you have zero copies, if you have a, if you have a, a regular expression for something you also can have zero more copies of that regular expression just fine, right? Uh, just by, as you go through it, you come back to the beginning and go through it several times, right? So like if you, this star was like a seven, you wanted seven copies of it, you just go through the DFA, uh, excuse me, you go through the NFA seven times, right? These proofs are really amplified here by non-determinism. We could not have done this with DFAs, right? Like if you recall, we kind of did the intersection of the Cartesian product with NFAs, with, with DFAs in the first lecture. We will, but this is much simpler to do with NFAs than doing with DFAs, so we don't have to think about that. We've proven that the base cases are regular languages. We've proven that the operations are regular languages. So we've actually, we've now concluded the proof by induction that every regular expression decides a regular language. For every NFA, uh, uh, for every regular expression, there exists an NFA. And in fact, not only does this algorithm give you a way to, uh, not only is this a proof of correctness of a, that every regular expression has an NFA, it's also an algorithm. This also gives you a process to convert any regular expression into an NFA, right? Yes? Um, so you know how there are like arrows for, I guess the last one, and it like points to accept state? Is it like all accept states lead back to that state, or is it just like all yes. leaves? All accept states lead back to the start state. Okay, so if there are like two accept states connected to each other, both accept states would still yeah, lead back. Yeah, sure, okay. absolutely, absolutely. Because as long as you reach an accept state, you've decided a oh, word in the language, you want another copy of it, right? Certainly. So this, let's use this proof that we've converted every regular expression to an NFA. Let's show a way you can actually... Uh, just like a quick example, how you can convert um, a regular expression to an NFA itself. Note that we don't care about the efficiency or the minimality of the NFAs or anything. We really just care that the NFA exists. So we're going to, in that spirit, just give an NFA for a fixed regular expression. So the regular expression I'm concerned with is, is A, B, union, A, A, B, Star, right? So this is any zero more copies of either AB or AAB. This one doesn't have a nice human natural understanding of what it is, maybe, but that's fine. It is certainly a regular expression for some set of strings. Uh, the way we're going to do this is just combine all the atomic pieces of our NFAs and just glue them together. So we're going to do like, uh, we had the NFA for A. And we had the NFA for B, right? OK, well, now we've given the NFA for A and the NFA for B. We can create the NFA for A, B, and A, A, B, right? So um, why did I put the epsilon here, even though it's obvious that I could have just done AB? Because I'm following exactly the rules as the way we proved it. We proved the concatenation of two regular uh, expressions has to do these epsilon transitions from the final states of the first to the start state of the second. Although, in some cases, that may be simplified and may be equivalent. So I'm going to just do a simplification step right now. In general, you may not be able to do this step, this simplification, but it's obvious that here that we can't because it's so, it's so atomically uh, ridiculous. And then I'll do the other one. I'll do this one next to it.
right? So these are much larger NFAs. I've now simplified them down to these two by getting rid of these unnecessary epsilon transitions. Okay, uh, we're building atomically from the outside in, from the smallest pieces to the outside pieces. Now what we want to do, so we've done AB, we've done AAB, we now want to do the union of those. So it's quite literally going to just be adding a new state. And now this is the start state. Okay. Now we need to do uh, zero or more copies of it. So we've done AB, we've done AAB, we now have done AB union AAB. So now we want to do AB union AAB star. So following our star algorithm, we're just going to uh, take the epsilon transitions as exactly as we say. This is no longer a start state. This is now the start and accepting state, and this is going to be an epsilon transition. Okay, cool. We've now built an NFA for that specific rejects. So that rejects does have an NFA. Is it a good NFA? Don't know. Um, well, you could, if I were to do this in practice, you could simplify this, right? So every string is going to start with an A. So maybe there's something there I can simplify. Maybe I do the A, B, and then I non-deterministically choose to add the A, right? Like I could do, maybe if I were to do this in practice, I could do like epsilon A or something like this maybe, right? Exactly. It's just like simplifying, but we just care about the existence. Exactly. So this, the fact that the, the DNFA exists at all is what we care about. We don't care uh, how simple or nice it is. The fact that the NFA exists. You know. Similarly, when we prove that every uh, NFA has an equivalent DFA, it gave us an exponentially large DFA, but it didn't matter. It just mattered that the, that the NFA existed at all. So, uh, in conclusion, we have successfully proven that the regular expressions are no stronger than the uh, NFAs, because each regular expression has an NFA. So they can't do anything more than NFAs can do. Now we need to prove that the NFAs can do exactly what the regular expressions can do, and then therefore we can conclude that they're the same. So that is, uh, uh, before we remark, so we, we'll, we'll say this one was done. And now we want to show that every NFA has a uh, regular expression. So before we converted an NFA, excuse me, a regular expression into an NFA, and that was fine. Now we're trying to convert NFAs into regular expressions. So this is going to be hard just immediately for one reason. First off, an NFA has structure. It has nice edges and states, and it has direction and topology. An NFA is a graph. Graphs are really nice at communicating structure. Okay? A regular expression is a string. So a string, in a, it's like in a linear ma manner, too, OK? You can, sometimes you can talk about graphs as strings, like you can do a top sort or something. But like, you can't really do that for all NFAs. So immediately, the fact that we're going to convert an NFA, basically a graph, into a regular expression should be hard and weird. It's going to be slightly hard and weird. There is a classic proof by induction of this, where you consider subsets of strings that go from state i to j through some other state k, and then you have three variables going on, and the proof by induction is like really complicated. Um, Sipser has this very unique proof. And he does, the, I don't know what you would call this, like the method of ripping states. Or like the ripping method. So basically, he notes this following sort of pen and paper uh, trick. If we have some structure that looks like this, let's say A, self-loop B, C, a D, if we have something like this, what are all possible paths that can get you from state S, we'll call this S and T. So consider this is a subset of some larger NFA. We, we want to go consider all possible paths from S to T and the kind of strings that can produce. So we can either take D or we can take A, zero more copies of B, and C. So actually, as a regular expression, you could do this. 
A, B star, C, union, D. That's basically his entire proof. He does a little proof of correctness. We'll, we'll elaborate on this one in a, a second. And this method is also nicer than the, like, the historic and classic proof by induction because it also gives you a method to convert an NFA into a regular expression rather than just proving that they're the same. So basically what he does is he defines a GNFA. So um, a GNFA, a generalized NFA, uh, is an NFA with uh, the following small changes. Each transition... Can, uh, has any rejects on it. Um, no uh, transitions incoming to start or leaving the single accept state. Um, every pair of states has uh, a transition. So this is what a GNFA is. And a GNFA is quite literally just an NFA with now, instead of single symbols on the transitions, it has... Um, entire regular expressions on the transition. So to give you a quick example of one that may um, be, we could do like, like quite literally any regular expression. We could do like A star, uh, B star, right? Something like this. So this is like a G NFA, right? So while a computation of an NFA like takes one symbol off the prefix, takes one symbol off the front of the string, like that's the cost to use it. The GNFA computation, it might be obvious what it's doing, but as if we were to say it out loud, it non-deterministically chooses a prefix of the string and then takes that as the computation branch. And we say that the GNFA accepts if there exists a choice of the prefixes per transitions to get you there. The GNFA, I actually don't care about it, and it's we don't really care about it, but it's used as a technique to prove that uh, we want to show that every NFA has an equivalent regular expression, and we can do that with the GNFAs instead. So GNFAs are themselves not that interesting, but they are the tool uh, to convert every NFA to a regular expression. So the way we're going to do this is like uh, step one, uh, make the NFA uh, nice. And the way you make it nice is you just make it satisfy these properties, if you can. Yes? Is that word next to four? four oh, that's six. totally unreadable. Uh, each transition has a rejects on it. No transition incoming to start or leaving oh, single accept state. Uh, the single accept state. Every pair of states has a transition. So to make the NFA nice, you basically uh, uh, make one accept state. Uh, I'll say it this way. This, by adding a new start and accept state, you basically make sure there's no outgoing transitions from the accept state, and there's no incoming to the start state. Uh, so, and every pair of states has a transition. How would you make the, given an NFA, how would you guarantee that it is also a GNFA with that property? This one's a little tough, actually. If you want to add a transition for every pair of states, including a state to itself, but you don't want to change the structure of the NFA, you want that transition to be useless, how would you uh, do that? Character outside of the language there. That way it's like. Never. Suppose we couldn't do that. Oh. What if you just had an epsilon 
Ah, that's close. So the epsilon transition does accidentally change the structure a little bit, right? Let's say I did, instead of B star, it was just B. Let's say I added epsilon or something. It's like, now I get this slide for free. The answer is, basically, what you're going to do is just going to add empty set. The empty set cannot be taken, ever. Right? Empty string is a prefix of every string. Empty set is a prefix of no string, basically. And it's a little gotcha, really. It's not really, there's not science here being done. So you make the NFA nice. Then you slowly rip out states. It's called the ripping method. So we go from three states here to two. So you just slowly delete the states one by one. You're going to be left with a start state and an accept state, and there's going to be only one transition. That transition is going to contain your regular expression. That's the method of ripping, basically. So like, um, again, classic proof is really hard and complicated. This proof of correctness is also really hard and complicated, but it's going to be obvious when we just do an example about why it's correct. So let's convert the following uh, regular expression to, uh, well, the following regular Let's convert the following NFA into a, uh, regular expression. So this is an NFA. We go, it's only two states. We go from any number of A's. We take the B. Then we have any number of A's and B's. Just probably looking at this one. And by the way, I chose a nice one that was kind of linear, almost. There's, there's not a lot of cross going on. Um, when you delete the state, by the way, you have to, cons this was a nice example because you just go from one to one. But uh, you have to consider all possible paths that go through that state. So it can actually become quite complicated about what's actually going on. That's why I want to do only a short and simple example. So, yeah, so if we were just to look at this and write it, it would be like A star, B, and you have to take the B to accept. But you can have zero or more A's, including zero, so it's going to be A star. Then it's any A or B, so that's going to be just sigma star, right? That's what that should give us, right? Just sanity check. Sometimes you can look at it and do it nicely. But here, uh, we're, we're, we're going to use the method of ripping. So first, we're going to add a new start and accept state. We're going to go like this. At every transition, everything, every modification we do, you should also believe that we haven't changed uh, anything about the correctness, the DFA, or the NFA. We haven't added or added more strings that we shouldn't, basically. Right? You should believe that this is equivalent to the one we just did. All we did is add a dummy start and a dummy end. Doesn't seem to change it, right? So uh, zero more copies here, and then when you accept, you just take this transition, right? So. Now let's say I wanted to eliminate uh, this state. Let's kill that guy. So how do we, all possible paths, and good thing I chose a small example here, all possible paths that go through uh, this state just go from here to here. So we can quite literally just do a very simple uh, uh, thing here. We're going to do something like this. We're going to do this. And then what's going to be here? So any transition that could go from here to here uh, follows the, the subset here of like the reject. So it can be uh, the epsilon, any number of A's, followed by a single B. So following our little uh, method here, this is going to be epsilon, any number of A's, followed by uh, a B. Right? Now, Epsilon in a regular expression sometimes is not necessary. Why? Right? So like as a string, like in general, epsilon a is always equal to a. Right? It's like, it's like multiplying by 1 or adding by 0. It's kind of an identity element of this, of this uh, algebraic object uh, here. But uh, so here we don't really need to write the epsilon, but I'm going to leave it just for correctness. Now I want to eliminate this state. Right? So what I'm going to do is do the same thing again. So we're going to, um, here, we're going to do this. Now we're going to have this 
uh, regular expression, followed by a comma b, which is what? A comma b is our shorthand, but it's not like a real notation. What would like a comma b be? Sigma. Yeah, it'd be like sigma, sigma, and then uh, the empty string. So this is going to be So that's the, that's the first part. It's going to be uh, sigma to the star, and then the second part, which is the, the last part, which is the empty string, right? If we were to simplify that down, we end up getting uh, a star, b sigma star, exactly as desired. So doing this process, you question? OK. Doing this process, you can convert any uh, regular expression to an NFA. Yes? Does the epsilon identity commute like is A epsilon A? Absolutely. Is A is A epsilon A? Yes. Why? It's like A and then nothing. Yeah. So it's like I mean like in if you think bring a programming intuition into anything, if you do like stir A or like like if you did like A dot join Right, that has to give you, right. It's going to be like a, if you consider these strings as arrays of elements, you can, the concatenation of those arrays, it's going to be the empty array, concatenate, right? So similarly, like, uh, I don't know, A epsilon A is going to be just AA as well, right? All right, so. Okay, so this is, so we, let's just conclude the proof here. We have now shown uh, that every regular, uh, every, no, we already did that one. Every NFA has an equivalent uh, regular expression. What am I doing in time? I have a few. I have a, a few more minutes. So, just to talk quickly about closure. Oops. Uh, we say a set. We say a set is closed under an operation if performing it returns the same type. So, like uh, the naturals are closed under addition and multiplication, uh, but not uh, subtraction, right? The addition of two natural numbers is natural. Multiplication of two natural numbers is natural. Subtraction of two natural numbers could be negative. So it's not going to be natural. Um, similarly, the regular languages, so I'm going to write this as LNFA, is closed under, today we proved it, it's closed under union, uh, concatenation and uh, the star operator. It's also closed under complement, right? Why? We kind of briefly mentioned it last time, actually. Why are the regular languages closed under complement? If you have an NFA, you can make that a DFA, and then you take the complement, which would also be a regular language if you had a DFA. Perfect, perfect. The NFA, you can't take the complement of the states of the NFA itself because there's implicit reject states, but the DFA is correct and perfect and has all the edge cases decided. So you take the complement of the set of states of the NFA, excuse me, of the DFA. By that we mean you make every accepting state rejecting, and every rejecting state accepting. Now you have a DFA for exactly the opposite. If the DFA can say yes and no, you now have the same DFA to say no and yes. Imagine you had a Boolean function that returns true and false. You now make it return false and true. Like, it's going to do the exact opposite, right? So same thing here, uh, basically. So they're also closed. The regular languages are also closed under complement.
So this is what we, what we mean by closure. Uh, let me say closure. Okay, let's take our little break.